What is up guys, Rambling Collector back here again with another book review for all of you. And today I will be covering one of my absolute personal favorites, George R. R. Martin's Dream Songs Volume 1. So, let's get into it, shall we? So, fun fact, I actually did receive this book about as of last year for as a Christmas gift for my parents. And to be quite honest with you guys, this was actually a top priority for my wish list that year. The main reason being is because as of that moment, I had only read some of Martin's Game of Thrones series, as in all the way from book one to five. As of this moment, I have yet to read Night of the Seven Kingdoms or Fire and Blood, but I was honestly more fascinated to read some of his earlier works. See, I kept hearing about Dream Songs for a while, and it kept popping up for a bit. And to be quite honest, I was actually curious to see how his writing evolved from years and years. Because, let's be honest, Martin has been around for quite a while. So, as of reading Volume 1, which contains nearly 700 pages worth, exactly 683 pages worth, of writing, with multiple short stories ranging from primarily there was one superhero, but most of the time it was more fantasy, science fiction, and even a bit of horror near the end. And after reading it, you guys, I'm actually curious to see what volume two contains. So as of right now though, I'm currently swamped in other books, so that might be a while. But if you all would like to stick around for a while, I would also would like to cover some of the short stories that really stuck out to me as I was reading this book. Granted, it has been a while, so my memory might not be the greatest, so I will say now there will be mild spoilers sprinkled throughout this whole review. However, one other thing that really stuck out to me is that in between different sections, of this book was that we actually got a glimpse of George Martin's life as he was growing up and what inspired him to read some of these fictional pieces. But back to the main topic, if you all are willing to stick around, I would like to cover some of the short stories that really stuck out to me throughout this book. So if you are still here and haven't clicked off as of yet, let's get into it, shall we? So to start off this review, we have The Fortress. From what I remember reading about this one, this was like a historical fiction piece done by Martin. As of right now, I've currently forgotten which time period this took place in, but the main premise of the story is that in a great northern fortress that has multiple soldiers and weapons at the ready waiting for another enemy strike, this one actually concerns two senior officers, one being the commander of the entire fortress, the other being a simple colonel. So, from what happens here in this story, the colonel actually finds out that his commanding officer is wanting to surrender to the enemy because he believes that they do not stand a chance against what could be an overwhelming force, despite the fact that the fortress has stood the test of time for many, many years and has continued to be a simple bastion of defense. And to be quite honest with you guys, as I was reading this, I actually wanted the Colonel to succeed. I really, really did. But in the end, the fortress is surrendered and years later, this commanding officer actually finds out that his choice at the time was the absolute worst he could have made. And I feel like the overall theme of this story was that in the end, it's to know when to stand your ground and when to surrender, or when to know that you're making the right decision, despite what might seem overwhelming odds that are not in your favor. As well as I also felt like this was another lesson of national pride versus cowardice 
Because in the end, the commanding officer was a coward. And he would be forced to live with the shame of that for years after his retirement, after his belief that he was doing the right thing, only to have it slammed back into his face. Whereas that colonel died a national patriot. And in my opinion, you guys, I think this story was the first one to really grab my attention within this anthology and really keep me pressed to read more. I feel like this is the one that really like hooked me further into the story. And this is just in one of Martin's earlier writings as well. I think this is possibly one of the only historical fiction pieces that he's done, at least as far as I'm aware. However, I'm not entirely sure, and if I am wrong, please let me know in the comment section down below. But, what I'm more excited to talk about is some of his science fiction. This one was good, don't get me wrong, and it's definitely worth the read at least once. If you want a good, engaging story that might actually grab your attention, this might be the one to do so. But, let's get on to some of the other stories in here. Because I am very eager to talk about some of his science fiction stories. So, let's go. So first up of the science fiction that really, that I just wanted to blather on about, is his short story, The Way of Cross and Dragon. Even now, after months of having read through this book, this story here stands out to me greatly both for the plot as well as the theme it was telling. So, The Way of Cross and Dragon actually stars within a small little fictional universe that Martin set up called the Thousand Worlds universe, right? Where mankind is called colonized thousands of worlds, and there are actually multiple short stories that take place in this timeline. And I might actually be covering more of them further throughout this review, but... The Way of Cross and Dragon is one of those that stood out to me because of the fact that for one, so, the story of this one actually stars the Catholic Church years down the road, and they are still active to that day. So the Way of Cross and Dragon involves how a Knight Templar, a senior Knight Templar, whom has started to question his own faith in the organization, as well as his own faith in God, as a result, is actually sent to another planet due to the fact that the planet has actually set up a new religion centered around Judas Iscariot, proclaiming him to be a noble martyr. So, on his way there to this planet, the knight actually receives a copy of the new book, the new holy text that is being distributed by this religion called The Way of Cross and Dragon, which describes how Judas Iscariot was essentially one of the most loyal and loving of Judas of Jesus's followers and before he even became a follower he actually was a commander of dragons and a master of spellcraft and he once ruled a great nation with his army of dragons hence the type I don't hear but anyways moving on so during this time Judas actually chooses to follow Jesus gives up his power, and becomes one of his most loyal followers. However, when Jesus is betrayed and crucified, Judas actually goes on a rampage for the next, next three days, burning all the kingdoms that sacrificed which is liege, and even killing Peter when he found out that Peter had actually denied Christ. However, once Christ returned, Judas was essentially blinded and was forced to watch as all of his dragons were killed right in front of him. And as such, Judas was forced to walk and repent and for thousands of years before he was accepted into heaven. And that's just the whole story that this knight is reading. Once he arrives at the planet, though, he actually finds something out that makes him really wonder what reality is. It turns out it's this whole universe-bending conspiracy of those who are liars, who are choosing to bend history behind the scenes. As well as it also tackles the 
actual question of faith, what we choose to believe in, or whether we choose to believe in something or not that makes something real. And be honest with you guys, as I was reading this one, this one actually hooked me up way into the hours of the night. Like, I was up till midnight, and I could not stop reading this one. But this one actually does bring up a lot of good point, points of what we choose to believe in, what could be real or not, depending on our certain point of view. And to this end, the knight actually does have those questions within his mind. And though he does choose in the end to stay with the Catholic Church, he actually does set a reminder for himself by naming his ship Dragon, in honor of that story that he read. Honestly, you guys, this one was definitely one of the best science fiction pieces. Well, one of. I say this now. Because there are a few here that, while this one was a good story overall, and it had a few questions, y'all know that Martin does manage to at least stab us with word shivs every once in a while that really makes us feel dead on the inside from the emotional blows. And this next one that I'm about to talk about really does manage to do that. So next up on the list we have Song for Laia. And surprisingly enough this one actually won a Hugo Award from Martin's writing. And to be quite honest after reading it myself I can understand why. But I will say this, Song for Laia will not hesitate to leave you feeling like you've just been punched in the gut afterwards, both emotionally and mentally. Like after reading this one, I'm not going to lie to you guys, I actually had to take a few minutes to process what the heck I just read, more importantly why I just felt like I'd just been punched. Like I actually had to take a few minutes just to process what I just read and not even in a bad way either like it just had me feeling that way like one thing I will say Martin does excellently with his writing is he makes you either question things or he leaves you with essentially a lot of emotions running through your brain so I will say he does a fantastic job of like keeping his readers attention but also messing with their emotions a bit Song for Laia definitely counts as one of those. So the main story here revolves around a telepath named Rob and an empath. No, let me take that back. An empath named Rob and a, and his lover, a telepath named Laia. And essentially, their whole goal here, the whole story revolves around them being sent to investigate a species that has supposedly been around since before humanity evolved. However, this species had not evolved past Stone Age worth technology, like living in stone huts and everything else, no advanced technologies, no nothing. What they come to find out is that this alien species actually has a parasitic relationship with a slime creature. However, what they believe to be a painful parasitic and devouring them is actually giving these alien creatures a sense of love and community far deeper than normal because there are no barriers between them like all who have this slime creature on them that is make no mistake it is like slowly feeding on these on this species and yet at the same time to all of them they feel no pain. They just feel everyone around them. They feel their entire species. All who are connected with this parasite actually have all their mental barriers dropped and just feel the emotions and thoughts of everyone around them, which creates a huge sense of community and love, which honestly shocked me as I was reading it, especially when later on you have these villagers just essentially opening up and telling what amounts to their life stories later on. But, anyways, 
I'm getting ahead of myself. So as Rob and Lai at one point use their abilities to study more of this civilization, they actually have come into contact with some of those who are infected with this parasite, and they actually feel those emotions. They feel that whole encompassing love. Like Rob himself is actually dumbfounded for a bit after feeling that whole sense of love. But for Laia, it hits her twice as hard because not only was she feeling the emotions, but the thoughts of everyone around her. Just that all-encompassing love for each other that she had supposedly never felt. And to be quite honest with you guys, as I was reading this, I kept on seeing the pattern of how these two, they try to essentially form that same level of bonding, but they can't. They feel as though there are barriers that are still between them, between Rob and Laia. And to be quite honest with you guys, this story does not have a happy ending. In fact, it has a very bittersweet ending. When you see the fate of Laia, and more importantly, what goes through Rob's mind at the end of this story, you yourself might be wondering, what is the true meaning of love? Is it simply to be a love for one's community and just letting everything go and just being bonded with everyone around you? Or is it simply believing and sticking with one partner? Is it just being with one partner to the best of your ability? Honestly, it will leave you wondering about this as a, you are reading. And in the end, it will leave you with essentially a little bit of pain. I'm not even going to lie to you. You'll feel a pain in your heart. But also you'll be left questioning and wondering, you know? And to be honest, this one is the one that had me like, I had to take a step back and just process this for a bit. By the end of it though, my mind was racing and my heart was hurting. But I will say this one was a fantastic piece of fiction. And as a matter of fact, this one actually falls into the Thousand Worlds fictional universe that Martin created. The same as Way of Cross and Dragon, and another story that I will be covering later in this review. Or I guess two, actually. But, in all seriousness though, let's take a little breather from science fiction, and let's shift the focus over to some of Martin's fantasy. At least one of his more iconic titles. So to move on to fantasy, here we have one of Martin's most classic pieces of literature, which is still well known today, and is in fact considered a nice children's story sometimes to read. The Ice Dragon. Starring our main character here, Adara. Someone who is essentially an outcast within her own family or at least that is how she feels. For she cares more for the colder things. She loves winter, but does not care for summer. And honestly, this one I definitely liked because it was a nice little classic piece of fantasy with dragons, enemy kingdoms, and such like that. But I really liked seeing the story of Adara playing out because she feels like the outcast of the family. Despite the fact that her family does love her, she feels distant from them because of her different preferences. Whereas her brother and sister are all about the light and warmth, she's more for the cold. And as a matter of fact, during this time, she actually meets a dragon that is completely made of ice. She does not care for fire breathing dragons, but this one she definitely feels bonded to. And to be honest with you guys, as I was reading this, I can now understand why it is a classic. It's definitely engaging, especially with the fact of how you have literally kingdoms of dragon riders going up against one another, which I thought was completely awesome. And it actually brought me back to the inheritance cycle as I was reading it. But honestly, this one I felt was a very good piece of fiction, but at the same time, not exactly the greatest. Like I read a lot of his other short stories before this, that really stuck out more 
in my personal opinion, but Ice Dragon definitely, I can understand why it is a classic. And I definitely like how this one has a bit of a happier ending. All things considered, it doesn't feel cliche in this one though. It feels like a well-deserved happy ending. But, to be honest, I definitely recommend picking this one up either by itself or just as part of this whole compilation. But this is only one of the fantasy bits that stuck out to me. There were many more that were also just as engaging, but I figured if I were to go over a lot of them, we'd be here for a much longer video. So this is just one of the big fantasy icons to me. And I can still understand why this is a considered classic of his literature. But let's prepare you guys for what comes next. Shall we? So one thing I did not expect to be reading as I was going through this anthology was actually a horror section. Like, I did not even realize that Martin had actually done horror series or even short stories whatsoever. So to find out that at the very back of this book was a whole section of horror written by George Martin, I want to lie to you guys. I was actually a bit on edge there. Because knowing Martin, he knows how to make things terrifying, but also engaging to the point of not wanting to stop reading. As well as not to mention the whole real horrors of humanity that he seems able to tackle. But these two, Sand Kings and Meat House Man, were the ones that really stuck out as I was reading the book. Especially for both the consequences and the dark sides of humanity are shown. Like Sand Kings, if I'm going to be honest, really highlights the whole feeling of consequences of your actions, as well as the cruelness of humanity in some cases. And I want to lie to you guys. Sand Kings left me. Like, the one thing I can say about Martin's works is that he doesn't really go for, like, full on scaring. It's more like an uncomfortable, on the edge of your seat kind of thing, if that makes any sense. He doesn't try to jump scare you or things like that. He doesn't rely on shock value. He generally just gives you like this whole uncomfortable feeling. Like you just feel uneasy. You feel like you're about to look over your shoulder. And in some cases you might feel disgusted to be a human being, but that's neither here nor there. So to start off with, Sand King that definitely dives into the whole consequences of your actions storyline here as a rich aristocrat actually buys a rare specimen like he's a collector of rare pets and the one that he actually finds from this mysterious pet shop owner is a group of insects known as sand kings a very intelligent hive mind type of species that can actually have psychic connections they psychically link with one another, and they actually link with someone whom they... Like anyone who owns these things would essentially become a deity to the Sand Kings. And this man apparently takes it way too far with how he treats these things, as well as what he does to simply entertain his guests in regards to the Sand Kings. Like, instead of actually taking proper care of them or listening to the precautions of the pet shop owner, he actually uses the Sand Kings to both earn money as well as entertain his guests by having these Sand Kings, which he buys about four colonies worth. He sets them up in a massive cage in his living room and just watches them as they build these castles or devour or other creatures or just set up their own castles like three out of four do well for each other the fourth one is kind of left as the underdogs the ones that are not really seen in all honesty though his choices do come back to bite him his cruelty and the consequences of his actions come back to bite him severely when at one point just to torture an ex-lover of his who does not like what he's doing he tortures her by actually recording these Sand Kings devouring a puppy. 
Yeah, completely sick. At one point during this, after sending her this recording, she comes back and she actually smashes open the cage. And the Sand Kings then become loose in his house. And you can just feel that mounting fear and unease as he is surrounded by the very insects that he had tortured and became a cruel deity to. Like he essentially created a god complex when he was feeding these things. And now they view him as a very cruel deity because of his actions and quite frankly now he's paying for it and I felt a bit of sick satisfaction watching that as I was reading it get pictured in my mind and I actually felt satisfied that this man was getting some of the consequences observed but to be honest with you guys then it just increased to mounting horror as I kept reading and the way this does end will leave you going well that just happened and at the same time you start to want under or well, at the very least it leads you with the lesson that A do not abuse any animals because at some point it could come back to bite you and secondly don't go to a shady pet shop like ever this is one of the main lessons I got from Sand Kings but now Meat House Man was generally one of the most uncomfortable pieces of fiction I'd ever read and in all honesty now this one really is like a deep human analysis and as a matter of fact Meat House Man and Sand Kings were actually another part of the Thousand Worlds universe that Martin created and I could definitely see that these are the more darker stories especially Meat House Man because this one actually revolves around a man who is simply living his life day in day out working on a mining world right so at this point the man is actually introduced to what is actually called a dollhouse which when I found out what the heck the dolls were like I was literally a bit disgusted because the fact that it's literally like a lobotomized female that is psychically linked to the customer and they actually both and they're actually psychically linked to provide the greatest the greatest experience for using this doll but honestly as I was reading it, I was just disgusted like me house man honestly is one of the more disgusting stories but after this after the one-time experience with the meat house as it's called this man slowly becomes addicted even despite the fact that he tries to find different relationships like with real people which I'm not gonna lie to you guys all of his relationships that he goes through he fails like they fail and it leaves him actually wondering what really is love to a person and he keeps coming back to the meat house like an addiction like a drug that every time a relationship fails he immediately goes back to the meat house it's like a never ending drug and him struggling with addiction even as he moves on to other planets and tries to find peace in another relationship with a human woman that isn't lobotomized or a freaking doll we still see him winding up coming back to that and as I was reading Me House Man, I just felt disgusted, but I could not stop reading. So this is definitely one that will leave you either wanting to drop the story or just wanting to skip this one altogether. But I will say Martin's horror, he does a damn fine job with it, all things considered. Like, he does not give you that, that kind of jump-scaring thing, it's more of an uncomfortable on the edge which I know I probably said that already but it is the truth like if you read these two for yourself you will understand what I'm talking about but I believe I've rambled on long enough so let's get on to the score shall we so in all honesty if it wasn't obvious already I would definitely give Dream Songs Volume 1 a solid 10 out of 10 for amazing variety of 
stories, great writing, and more importantly, just keeping me hooked from page one all the way to page 683. And honestly, guys, I would definitely recommend picking this one up for yourself, whether in hardback or paperback. While I myself have the paperback edition, I am more than willing to go out and grab either the paperback or the hardback for Dream Songs Volume 2. Which, if I ever do manage to get my hands on that, I will do a review of that as well. All in all, you guys, if you want a good bunch of variety, like if you're a fan of short stories or anthologies, or just interested in seeing some of Martin's other writings besides Game of Thrones, I would highly recommend picking up Dream Songs. I'd recommend giving it a chance, and I would more than happily say it is definitely an engaging one. Hell, you might actually want Martin to continue with A Thousand Worlds, just to see more of what he can come up with. Anyways, you guys, if you've stuck around to the end of this video, thank you so much for listening to this crazy man's ramblings. And if you want another anthology like this with multiple different authors, I would actually say check out from the Warhammer 40,000 universe, I would actually recommend checking out Nexus, as it is under the same vein of everything taking place in the same universe, but it's all under different authors. But if you want another anthology like it, I would either recommend, I would actually recommend Lord of the Dark Millennium by Dan Abnett. But anyways, you guys, if you've stuck around this long, thank you all for listening. And this is Rambling Collector, signing off for now. And if you have any other book recommendations, please let me know in the comment section down below. Again, thank you all for listening. Have an awesome day.